back-to-back massive disasters have more than 1,500 American Red Cross volunteers working tirelessly from coast to coast right now, providing food, shelter, and comfort to thousands of people in need. Over the past several weeks, the Red Cross has provided more than 47,000 total overnight stays in emergency shelters and emergency lodgings across multiple states. With the help of partners, we've served more than 520,000 meals and snacks and distributed nearly 200,000 relief items, such as comfort kits and cleaning supplies. Red Cross volunteers have provided more than 27,000 individual care contacts to help people with medical or disability needs, as well as emotional and spiritual support during these challenging times. There are still 1,300 Red Cross disaster workers helping people affected by Hurricane Ida, including 16 from Northern Ohio. What are they doing? In California, thousands of people are under evacuation orders as massive wildfires continue to burn. Red Cross disaster workers, such as those you see now, have been on the ground since June, helping evacuees find a safe place to stay, food to eat, and emotional support during this heartbreaking time. Four of the Northern Ohio Red Cross volunteers who traveled to California to respond are with us now, talking about their experiences and hopefully encouraging others to be a hero like them and volunteer. Laura Matamo, Michelle Nieswender, Kathy Bankowski, and Beth Orgel are back from assignments. Well, everybody but Laura, she's back on assignment. So we'll go to you first, Laura. Thank you all for joining us today. And can you, Laura, tell us uh, where you are and what you're doing? I am in Nevada right now at the convention center here. We opened a shelter here a few weeks ago and um, the fires have moved now. So we're looking to close down this shelter. So we're, we're helping the residents here transition back to their homes where they were before the fire threatened them and so that we can close this facility down. Did you expect to go back so soon? I, actually, I, I knew that I was on call. There's a there's a national list of people who are willing to go, and I knew that my name was on the list. So when I came out the first time, I figured that they would be calling me again. Since it is hurricane and wildfire season, I figured there was a pretty good chance. And you, you say you're, you're going to be taking down a shelter? Yes. So uh, we help the residents transition back to their homes, which are now safe. And then we load up all of our Red Cross belongings and take them back to the warehouse and whatever community partners we have here, we contact them to let them know that this isn't going to be a site anymore. Um, and there's always during wildfire season, there's always new shelters opening and closing in different communities as the needs change and the wildfire shift. Uh, I, you've worked with uh, some of these others uh, people here from Northwest Ohio. All of you are from Northwest Ohio. Kathy Bankowski, uh, what was your job when you were in California? Uh, I was in the shelter. I actually worked with Laura. She was in charge of us. And, um, you know, I would help the people get set up uh, if they needed anything. For example, uh, we had three people that didn't have any other clothing with them. So I went to a 
um, thrift store that was in the in the small town that we were at. And uh, the guy was very nice and said anything that any of the people in the shelter needed, that I could just take whatever I wanted and he wasn't going to charge us for anything. So I got him pants and, and a couple shirts so that they could shower and have something to change into. So, uh, this, you know, and I helped get a breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, things like that. It's amazing the generosity of people that comes out during times like this, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I, the, the town of Portola was, they were so kind and people kept donating. They would bring bags of clothes in um, for anybody that was at the shelter that they could have whatever they wanted. And um, there were some other things, the, the um, priest, he bought uh, tubs for the people to put their belongings in. So it wasn't just like scattered all over in little bags. And that, I mean, they just loved it. They were very grateful to the um, priest to, you know, purchase those things. So. Uh, let, me, let me ask Michelle, because you are a very, very active Red Cross volunteer uh, deployed to uh, just about every home fire that happens in Northwest Ohio, it seems. <laughs> How did you find time to break away and go to California to respond to wildfires? Um, it's just a passion of mine. Um, something that I truly enjoy to help folks um, on their way to recovery, listening to their stories. Um, you know, they all have a story. And for somebody to listen to those folks and um, get their needs taken care of, um, it, it's very humbling. Um, some of some of those folks have, you know, mental health needs, they have some medical needs and to be able to support them with our health service team and just, you know, in the organization in general and with the community, it's just, it's a very humbling experience. It's nothing else that you can ever imagine. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, I'm ready to go back when I'm, when I'm able here in a few weeks, I'm going to be able to go back too. So, um, yeah, it's super cool. <laughs> Those fires aren't gonna aren't going to stop anytime soon, are they? No, the fires aren't gonna stop anytime soon. Um, you know, hurricanes are still going out there, and then as well here on the home front, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, had you had you had you ever responded to a wildfire before? No, this is my first time to a wildfire, and um, you know, to kind of understand how a wildfire works, um, you know, because it. it it can change. It can change with the weather. It can change with the wind. Um, and you always have to, you know, you have to always be prepared. And, um, you know, as the American Red Cross motto goes, you know, be flexible, um, be flexible in yourself and be flexible with the clients. Um, cause it's, it's ever changing. And, um, you know, that's what makes it so interesting. Yeah. Being flexible is kind of the mantra of disaster response for the Red Cross, but especially wildfires because, uh, you never know what direction they're going to be in. Uh, let's bring in Beth Orgel. Beth, hi. you were talking about, hi, uh, your your job is a little bit different than these other three, isn't it? Yes. I'm, Explain uh, it. Okay. I'm a retired RN, and I started working for the Red Cross. Well, I was still working. Uh, I've been doing it now for about five years. Um, and I'm in disaster health services, and I was just promoted to supervisor and that's what my job was i was the the disaster health supervisor for that shelter in portola and um i spent a lot of time actually all of my time we had a, a number of covid positive clients that were in isolation so that's um that's what i was doing some of them were quite ill some of them were just there counting out their 10 day isolation, but we were busy. Bad enough to have to deal with the effects of a wildfire when you lose your home and all your possessions, all your belongings, but then to have to deal with the pandemic as well. It's just it's almost unbearable, it seems. It was, it was difficult. It was extremely difficult on them. Um, a number of the clients didn't understand why they were on isolation um, because they were feeling well. They were saying, I don't, I don't, I feel fine. I feel fine. Why do I have to be down here? Because we had them 
in classrooms in the uh, church basement and they weren't allowed out other than to walk to the restroom and back. And to do that and to stay in one room for 10 days is very, very long. I mentioned that it's uh, it's unpredictable. You don't know what direction the fire is going to take. And you had a you had a pretty scary moment, I understand. Actually, it happened twice. We were put on alert twice when the Dixie fire was headed in our direction and the alarms were going off on our phones and loudspeakers and uh, in the community itself um, that we might have to evacuate. So I was, you know, that's the fire coming over the ridge. That's only about six miles from where we were. And the only thing that saved us was the wind shifted and the fires started heading uh, west towards Reno. But we had packed up all our supplies in the health services department and we were helping our clients in isolation pack what they needed and trying to figure out how we were going to transport these folks that were in isolation because you couldn't put them in a bus with the rest of the shelter clients. So we, we had some scrambling to do. Well, and how did you do it finally? We didn't have to. The wind shifted. Oh, and good. We had yeah. to stay where we were. I'm going to add. Every, I'm going to add the others to the chat now. Did any of you have the similar experience, thinking that you were going to have to um, abandon your post, so to speak, in order to uh, avoid being a victim of the wildfire yourself? Yeah, all four of us were there that the first time that happened when they issued an alert and it was like our shelter, the street, a parking lot, the river, and the evacuation zone. So it was just a warning, thank goodness, not an order. Um, but we were all part of that team that was asked by headquarters to put together a plan. So we had to figure out how many people had their own car, how many people would need a bus, how many people were COVID positive, and we we were all part of that that day when we had to put together that plan for what we were going to do if we did have to get up and move. So it's, it's it was great. When I showed up at Fort Hall, it was great to have people that I already knew there. It was fantastic to have a team from home that was all able to work together. Of course, everyone works together well on these DRs, but it's, that day when we had to put that together, it worked out really well. It's not it's not typical that the, that four people from the same a uh, chapter uh, are put together on a DRO 3,000 miles away. Here's a photo <laughs> of the four of you. Oh, I remember. Oops, sorry, Beth, go ahead. I said, I remember that photo. I remember when that was taken. Very nice. You meet, um, you meet all kinds of people on a deployment, but to meet people from your own backyard is kind of awesome isn't it it was great it was fun and we all ended up in the same shelter <laughs> all the shelters that were open uh yeah. we so all ended up in the same one you weren't able to stay in hotels you had to stay in a, a staff shelter no i was i was in a hotel they usually oh. put the nurses in hotels first if there are limitations and there are only a certain number of hotels available. The RNs are usually the first ones to be housed in hotels because they found out from previous uh, emergencies that if the nurses get sick, then they've really got a problem. So um, rather than leave us in staff shelters, we're, the, we're fortunate enough that we're the first ones to get hotel accommodations if available. Last year, during the wildfires of the same region, the California Gold Country region, I was working remotely and we were trying to find people hotel rooms because we were in the height of the pandemic and the congregate sheltering just wasn't the best option at that time. So um, I'm going to play a bit of a clip from that fire last year and maybe you can tell me if this looks any different to you or if it's familiar to you. I no, that's not it. Hang on here a second. I got it. Here it is.
That's pretty much what it looked like. Um, Michelle and I on our one day off went to Greenville and that's pretty much where most of our um, residents came from. And it was just miles and miles of devastation. It was kind of depressing on a day off to go see that, but um, that's pretty you know, much what we saw too. We live in an area of the country that is very seldom beset by wildfires or hurricanes or even flooding to a great extent. It's, uh, I, I almost feel as if it's incumbent on us to volunteer to help people who are affected by these things, don't you? Absolutely. We're, we're, we're lucky. We really are. I'm sorry, Michelle, go ahead. And that's okay. Um, you know, it's just, you know, folks from our area, just like you said, um, you know, we don't have, you know, maybe snow, we might have a you know, <laughs> snow thing happen. Um, but you know, it's for people to understand, um, the scope of what we, you know, take on during a disaster and what, you know, people have to go through and where they've been, you know, to explain to them that, you know, volunteers are needed just so that, that they can feel some kind of security. And, you know, it's, it's, it's super important to, you know, give us that chance to help people in any aspect to, you know, get back to a normal life after such a disaster. Uh, do any of you have a particularly poignant story that you'd like to share from your last appointment? Um, someone who uh, may have touched your heart or someone who you were able to help? Kathy and I may have a few. <laughs> <laughs> loaded, loaded question, huh? Yeah. I, I, I think our favorite client was all the husky. Yeah. We all love yeah. the husky. <laughs> One of our oh. clients had a dog that we would volunteer to take for walks because she was so sweet. <laughs> well, uh, Tia was a, a shelter. Tia was um, a, a, not a shelter Com animal. Comfort was, dog. Huh? No, she was a licensed dog. She wasn't a comfort a service dog. animal. Yeah, she was she, a service yeah, dog. She was yeah. an actual service animal for a uh, veteran. And it was pleasure having Tia. Um, in the shelter she, with us. She helped, yeah, she helped a lot of people. <laughs> with, her, with, yeah. her, with her kindness, you know, uh, for sure. But um, yeah, we had a lot of folks, um, you know, and Beth, and I know Laura and Kathy can all confess, you know, we had some medical needs. And um, so, you know, with Beth, Beth been able to help us with that. And, you know, just, we had folks from all, walks of life, you know, um, we had one gentleman who, um, who was blind. Um, we had three that was on oxygen. Um, we had, um, another gentleman who, you know, he liked to have his dinner for breakfast. I mean, <laughs> Hey, you know, um, but you know, you just kind of learn, you learn everybody, everybody be kind of came in their own little community and it was just, it was, uh, it was awesome to see everybody just kind of coming together, no matter where they were from. It, it didn't matter. You know, everybody helped each other. Um, I guess the, the one that was most heartbreaking for me happened on the last day of my deployment. Um, I had one gentleman left in isolation, and the entire time he was in isolation, he was talking uh, with neighbors and he was talking with contractors and plumbers, electricians, whatever, um, to get his home back up and running and get the water back on and electricity, etc. And then the last day that I was there, we found out that his home had burned and I had to tell him that that his his home was gone. And that was only a couple of hours before I yeah, left. You, we that, that's uh, that, that can't be easy. It, it wasn't. It, I bet. Can I say something about the fires? Yeah. Um, I've been volunteering in Northwest Ohio for 25 years, and I've seen a lot of homes burn in, in those years. Um, the damage that we have um, it, from a house fire in when a house burns down because of an electrical fire, there's a lot of damage and people, the people who live there are really sad by that. When these wildfires go through, all that's left of their home is a pile of ash. 
Like they, there's no retrieving any of their belongings. Um, and it's, it's any home fire is heartbreaking, but these wildfires burn so hot that it's especially heartbreaking for these clients because there's nothing left of their home. Everything they own is gone. To piggyback on what Laura says too, it's not just that they lost their home, which here it's devastating when somebody loses a, a home, but they've lost their whole community. They can't, if they go back, if they buy a trailer and go back and put it on their land, there's nothing there. There's no grocery store. There's no mini marts. There's, there's nothing, absent, no neighbors, no anything. The whole town is gone. And that's what I think a lot of people don't realize. They see a little snapshot picture of, oh, so their house burnt, you know? So they buy another one or move into another one, but it's, it's not that easy. They came from a community and their whole community has lost everything. So it's not just one person, it impacts the whole community. That's true, Kathy. That's what I found. I was in Chico two years ago after the Paradise Fire, after the community of Paradise uh, burned down. And in health services, we were trying to help um, people get new prescriptions, eyeglasses, wheelchairs, whatever it is that they'd left behind. And the biggest problem we found is all the doctors, the dentists, the pharmacies were all gone. And we had no idea where these folks had gone to if they were in shelters themselves and we were scrambling to get people the help that they needed and the supplies that they needed you can't get insulin if the pharmacy is gone no it well, those are um that that that's something that you just don't think about but obviously is true if everything has been taken away by a fire Michelle, I want to give you the last word. What would you say to someone to encourage them to become a Red Cross volunteer? I would encourage somebody to become a Red Cross volunteer to help anybody out there who is part of a disaster. Um, you know, home, it could be national, it could be local. You know, we do have fires here locally and, you know, it's not just wildfires and hurricanes. It's, you know, on the local home front too. Um, you know, uh, they can go to, you know, the Red Cross website and sign up and then go through some of the training and then go into a position that where they feel comfortable and they can help somebody. You know, we have a plethora of uh, areas that they can go into to, to help and service anybody um, who's going through a disaster. Redcross.org slash volunteer today. That's um, it. Uh, you, you, you stalwart volunteers, I appreciate so much not only the time you've given us here today to express your experiences with everyone, but also the service that you give to the people who are in need and who are served by the Red Cross. Thank you so much. Is there well, anything anybody would like to add? Well, it's not all gloom and doom. I feel like we talked about all the bad stuff and the sad stuff, but we had a lot, of, we had good times too. We laughed with a lot of our um, residents and, you know, we, you know, did some fun things. So it wasn't all just gloom and doom. I don't want anybody to think, oh, that sounds depressing. <laughs> you meet some amazing people. I love the volunteers that I met on this deployment. Everybody really pulled their own weight and it's a community and these are ladies now that I hope I'll see and work with again. You, you make lifelong friends, don't you? Yes. All right. Well, um, I'm, I'm so glad that you, um, that you're back safely. Uh, and, uh, Laura, I hope you come back safely and I'm sure you will when your deployment is done. Michelle, uh, we'll be talking to you. I'm sure, uh, Absolutely. from another, distant location soon. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you all. Thanks, thank you. Jim. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.